My lords, uh, I'd like to open by congratulating the noble uh, Lady Baroness Burt of Solihull on securing this second reading of her bill and thank her uh, for the tone in which she uh, opened this important debate. Um, and like others, I'd also just like to acknowledge uh, the courage of those noble lords and noble uh, baronesses who've experienced d direct uh, discrimination or prejudice because of their sexual orientation. Uh, as we've heard uh, in your Lordship's House, the Noble Ladies Bill would make provision to prohibit sexual orientation and gender identity conversion therapy across the United Kingdom. And the government shares the Noble Ladies' goal to protect uh, vulnerable people from harm and it remains our intention to publish a draft bill for pre-legislative scrutiny. However, I must express reservations about this bill and raise concerns relating uh, to four areas. Uh, the definition of conversion therapy, the inclusion of suppression within the offence, the use and lack of definition of gender identity, and the proposed territorial extent of the bill. And a number of these issues have been raised by your Lordships uh, today. But taking these issues in turn, firstly, in terms of the terminology and definition, the government now uses the term conversion practices to reflect the fact that conversion acts take a range of different forms and to avoid conflation with legitimate talking therapies. Furthermore, I'm also concerned that the definition is very wide in scope, appears to lack precision and clarity, and therefore leaves it vulnerable to misapplication. And it's vital that any legislation targeting these harmful practices does not affect the ability of parents, teachers, counsellors, religious leaders, or healthcare pr practitioners to have open, exploratory, and sometimes even challenging conversations, particularly with young people who are expressing or exploring their sexual orientation and or their gender identity. In particular, I worry that such a broad definition would create a chilling effect for those working in the legitimate clinical care sector who may feel too nervous to conduct their jobs out of fear of potential criminalisation. This in turn could negatively impact those people who are seeking and indeed needing support in relation to feelings of gender distress, gender dysphoria, or indeed in coming to terms with their sexual orientation. I must also express reservations around the inclusion of suppression within the scope of the offence. This risks a very wide range of acts being criminalised and is likely to disproportionately impact freedom of thought, conscience and religion. Moving on to the use of the term gender identity, whilst we agree that any protections should include all those at risk, whether straight or gay, transgender or not, the government has significant reservations about relying on the term gender identity. This is not a recognised term within our existing legal framework and is a contested belief. Introducing it in this way risks a lack of legislative clarity which would likely make prosecutions difficult and set an unhelpful legislative precedent which could have much wider ramifications in both criminal and civil law. Finally, the bill proposes to legislate for the whole of the UK this would be problematic because, of course, criminal justice is fully devolved to our Scottish and Northern Irish counterparts. But let me be clear that the government's opposition to this bill does not mean that we're complacent about the harm conversion practices can cause. We absolutely condemn conversion practices. They are inherently wrong and have no place in our society. Uh, as uh, a number of noble lords pointed out uh, many harmful physical violent acts done in the name of conversion practice are already illegal in this country as of course they should be. 
as equality ministers have said, these acts are aimed at changing someone else's identity, whether that be to or from being lesbian, gay, bisexual or transgender, or indeed heterosexual, and have no place in UK society. But there remains a gap, albeit narrow, in the existing legislative framework, including surrounding non-physical and speech-based acts, such as one-off instances of significant verbal degradation or abuse that are not covered by existing legislation. Um, in other examples, I would point to the um, uh, CAS interim uh, report, um, which notes, and I quote, the complex interaction between sexuality and gender identity and societal responses to both. For example, we have heard from young lesbians who felt pressured to identify as transgender male and conversely transgender males who felt pressured to come out as lesbian rather than transgender. Uh, in co concluding, my lords, these examples highlight just how complex but essential it is to legislate in a balanced and a measured way, alive to all the potential impacts of the approach taken, both intended and unintended. And that's why the government has plans to bring forward its own draft legislation for pre-legislative scrutiny by a committee of both houses on this issue, which has been thoughtfully considered over some time and crucially informed by public consultation. Uh, in concluding, I'm grateful to the noble lady for engaging on this important issue. Her bill has allowed for further consideration and discussion on how to tackle these abhorrent practices. Uh, but on the basis of the specific issues that I outlined earlier, I'm expressing reservations on behalf of the government on the Noble Ladies' Bill.